Brianna, she loved ministry. She, she was into us. She was a pilot, and she would fly all over the world practically, sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> share Jesus with the world. We are called to take his light in a world where wrong seems right. What could be too great a cost for sharing life with one who's lost through his love our hearts can share all the griefs they bear they must hear the words of life that only we can share need the Lord. People need my Lord. At the end of broken dreams, he's the open door. People need the need my Lord. When will we realize that we must live our lives for people need the the salt of the earth we are the salt of the earth see there's so many people in this world that are that are in pain today Brianna wanted the world to know that Jesus died for those very tears that they've been suffering 
He's here, even here with us right now because he loves us with a love that will never stop. You said you'd come to share all my sorrows. You said you'd be there for all my tomorrows. I came so close to sending you away. But just like you promised, you came there to stay. I just had to pray. If you know the song, sing with me, won't you? And Jesus said, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. I filled every teardrop. When in darkness you cried And I strove to remind you That for those tears I died Oh Jesus, I give you my heart and my soul for i'll know without you i never be whole i know you're here now and always will be his love loosed my chains and now I am free But Jesus, why me? And Jesus said, come to the water Stand by my side I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. I filled every teardrop when in darkness you cried, and I strove to remind you that for those tears I died and I strove to remind you that for those tears I died He loves you with a love that will never stop. And one day, one day he will appear in the clouds and he will call us by name. And the Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who are alive will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air and we will see him face to face. There's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul. I can say it is well. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise 
when he calls my name no more sorrow no more pain i will rise on eagles wings before my god fall on my knees and rise i will rise there's a day that's drawing near when the darkness breaks to light and the shadows disappear and our faith will be our eyes Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed the victory is one he is risen from the dead and i will rise when he calls my name no more sorrow no more pain i will rise on eagles wings before my god Fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. And I hear the voice of many angels sing. Worthy is the Lamb. And I hear the cry of every longing heart. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy, you are worthy. Worthy, you are worthy. Death, where is your sting? We will rise and we will see Jesus face to face. Are you ready for that? And I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow. I will rise on eagles' wings before my God fall on my knees and rise I will rise I will rise I will rise hold on weeping man Endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning, amen? The best is yet to come. We'll see loved ones who have gone before us and who are now asleep in Christ Jesus. But on that day, we will see them again. And Jesus promised he will wipe away every single teardrop from our eyes. No more suffering, no more sorrow, no more pain. Jesus is coming again. Hold on for the Savior will soon return. The timeless thing, earth and heaven will pass away. It's not a dream, God will make all things new. That day gone is the curse from which I stumbled and fail evil is banished to eternal hell no more night no more pain no 
a crying again. Praises to the great I am. We will live in the light of the reason. Look forward to it because he's coming again. See all around, now the nations bow down to sing. The only sound is the praises to Christ our King. Slowly the names from the book are read. I know the king, there's no need, no need to dread no more night. No more pain, no more tears, never crying again. Praises to the great I am, we're gonna live in the light of the risen lamb see over there there's a mansion all prepared just for me where i can live with my savior eternally and there will be no more night. Jesus is coming again. No more pain. Never crying again. Praises to the great I am. We're going to live in the light of the risen Lamb. Oh, oh, praises to the great I am. We're gonna live in the light of the risen more suffering, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain. Jesus is coming again. Even so, come, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. Wow, that was inspirational. Praise the Lord, that was wonderful. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> We have a gentleman here tonight. He is a pastor, he's a mission pilot, a nurse, aviation mechanic, and visionary. He is commonly known as Uncle David. Especially to young people, he has served as a missionary in many countries, including Peru, Mexico, Guyana, Brazil, Bolivia, Venezuela, Trinidad, and Tobago. And I'm sure many other countries. And so we have him here tonight. And so our uh, Pastor David Gates will kind of come up here and uh, uh, at this time. Thank you. Let's welcome Pastor David Gates.
as we drove down the road from Paradise this afternoon coming to the program, along the road we passed a little lonely cross. That was the location where Brianna breathed her last breath. I had the privilege on several occasions of talking to Brianna, and she asked Uncle David, I want to be a mission pilot. I need your advice. What do I do to prepare? And the last meeting we had, she had already finished her basic training. She had already finished her instrument rating. She said, what next? And I said, in addition to flying, you need to also have another skill. It could be maintenance, be a uh, uh, airplane mechanic. Nursing is also an excellent choice because you will be taking care of patients. And everywhere you go, you will be always expected to be involved in media because you will be expected to document and videotape and photograph the work you're doing so that people can participate with you and those that support you want to know what is happening. I gave her those three choices. I did not know that she did not choose one of the choices. She chose all three. At her funeral, I found out. I, I think the title for tonight of the little presentation, short presentation I'm going to do, Adventures in Mission Aviation might be a misnomer because I'm going to share some adventures and you will tell me if you think they're adventures. I was 18 years old. I had finished my basic training. I had worked very hard and I was able to buy a small two-seater airplane. My father was an experienced mission pilot and he was giving me some training on short field takeoff and landing as I prepared to be a mission pilot. The plane went in for an inspection, came out of the shop. We did not know that one of the landing gear bolts that fastened the landing gear to the fuselage was loose. My father took me to a short runway and he said, I'm going to do a couple of landings, and I want you to also learn how to land this plane in very short runways. He did two, two landings. He said, I will do one more. There was a tractor combine harvesting next to the runway. And he, as he came in for the third landing, little did we know what was about to happen. He had a conviction and he, he didn't stop until he said, you know, we have to have shoulder harnesses in this airplane. The plane did not come with shoulder harnesses. We have to install shoulder harnesses. And the day before, he had installed shoulder harnesses in the airplane. And when we landed the third time, the gear just folded. And with one landing gear, we, shout out, we shot out across the runway and went head-on collision into the combine. The plane folded like an accordion. And I now know what deathly silence sounds like. There is a crash, and then there's nothing but silence. Blood started flowing. They quickly came and took us out of the airplane. If it weren't for the shoulder harnesses, our, our heads would have been severely damaged and all those instruments would have, our face would have just gone right into the instrument panel. That's how I started my mission training, wondering why I was still alive. After finishing college, marrying my, my childhood sweetheart, finishing nursing, Finishing the aviation training, we decided to go work in Mexico. 
The General Conference sent us, sent us an invitation asking us to choose between Peru, Brazil, and Mexico. We spoke with the different union presidents and decided that God wanted us to go to Mexico. They needed a hospital administrator, had to be bilingual, had to be a medical professional, had to be a professional pilot. It seemed like that was exactly what God had prepared us for. So we went to Mexico. I was 25 years old, two children. A few years later, I came in for landing one afternoon, found the runway full of water, landed on a nearby long narrow country road, left the plane in the hands of uh, the guard for the hospital. The next morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, there was a knock on my door, Capitan, Capitan, there are soldiers by the airplane. They need to look at your papers. Everything was in order, so I took the papers along. I took my passenger with me, the director of education for the conference. They took a look at the papers, went and talked to the general on the radio, came back, put a, put a machine gun in our back. We were hijacked, taken to an abandoned runway, blindfolded, handcuffed, interrogated all day, thrown into a military prison, accused of 15 crimes against the state, thrown into a federal prison, and told that we were going to be there for 14 years. Quite traumatic when you just started your mission work. I complained to the Lord about it. It's not fair. He said, not everything is fair. I said, I'll negotiate with you. If you get me out of this place, I will love and serve you forever. The response was very clear. I don't negotiate. You can choose to love and serve me, or you can choose to do your own thing. What do you want? I know what you're going to do. If I choose you, you will keep me here for 14 years. He said, I'm not making any promises. It's your choice. I'll serve you. If I do it my way, it's always worse. Good. Then what I want you to do is to offer your services as a registered nurse to the prison director. But I don't want to serve anybody. I'm depressed. I'm angry. I feel abused. And I'm supposed to take care of patients? That's your choice. Stop thinking of your problems and do what I tell you. I was in a little shower, a little tiny corner with a pipe of water coming out. There was mud all over the floor. And I was arguing with God. I said, I'll do it your way. Yes, sir. I wasn't in a happy mood. Immediately after I talked to the prison director, he put me to work taking care of 50 patients a day. God opened the, the, the doors for our chief surgeon to come and do surgeries. The pastor's wives started bringing me plenty of food. The union sent a legal representative who finally, after several days, gave up and said, the government wants you here. They want to keep your airplane, and they are willing to do anything necessary to keep you in prison in order to justify the, the, the seizing of your airplane. That was a very depressing day. It seemed like all hope had disappeared. The lawyer had given up. He was saying, I can't do anything else. He even offered to stay in my place if they would let me go. He was a very wonderful man, but he gave up. I remember that dark night, locked up with 70 other prisoners in one cell. It's like cordwood stacked up on a side. I said, Lord, I'm doing what you tell me to, but it's not working. Whatever long it takes, however long it takes, just do my will. It's always the best plan. Yes, sir. The next day, the prison director called me and said, go get your things. Yes, sir. Where are you taking me? Sign right here in this big book. Where are you taking me? Sign. Yes, sir. He said, guard, open the prison gate. Mr. Gates is free. I said, what happened? I'm free? He said, I, after seeing the medical work that you were doing, after watching you for all this week, 
doing medical care. You brought in doctors, you brought in food, you brought in clothing, you took care of the others. He goes, I know a criminal when I see one, and you are not one. He said, you are free to go home. I went and threatened the prosecuting attorney with corruption, and he agreed to let you go, and he signed the papers. You can go home. Well, if God would have told me that, I would have loved and trusted him. God doesn't tell us ahead of time what the end scenario looks like. He just says, trust me. To the pain, to the loss. Eventually, after many years of working for the denomination in different responsibilities, in several unions, teaching as assistant professor of computer science, graduate professor and associate professor in graduate business studies, we decided to go to Guyana to work as a family for one year. I found out that in Guyana, there were certain areas of the country that were divided, the villages. This village belongs to this church. This village belongs to this church. This village belongs to that church. And you're not allowed to go between villages. There was one village in particular that had built a village specifically on the foundation. They wanted no Seventh-day Adventist in that village. And so when they found out there was a pilot flying around giving medical, free medical care, they said, not in this village. And I flew for almost a year until one day we got a call from that village. They said, we have a lady who walked out of the jungles with malaria. Could you please come and get her? She's almost dead. I said, my first time to that village? I was a little scared because I knew the runway had not been cared for. High grass. You don't know if there's a log under the runway, a hole under the runway. And when I landed there, I, I took a chance because I wanted to reach that village. But I could have destroyed my airplane. But I said, Lord, you take care of what's underneath there. I don't know what's there. Even a turtle could be, a big turtle could break, destroy the landing gear. I landed, and there was a lot of Indians with their arms folded, scowling at me as I, as I taxied by. It was kind of scary. I got there. They brought a lady out. I noticed she had five children. They each kissed her mother goodbye, put her in the airplane, and I flew her to the hospital. A couple days later, I stopped by the hospital. Doctor, how is the lady from Philippi doing? She passed away last night. Oh, I was so hoping that that lady from Philippi, that I could save her life. What are you going to do with her body? We're going to bury it here. You're not going to send her body back to Philippi? Oh, <laughs> Captain Gates, you know it takes three or four days to go by canoe. And in the sun, with a body that's dead, in the heat, it would never work. I said, call the village, make arrangements. I will make a special flight to Philippi. I will fly her body back. They made arrangements. They started putting together a casket. I put the ladies, took the seat out, put the ladies' body there, wrapped up in a white sheet. I flew back to the village. When I got there, there was no scowling men. There was only a bunch of villagers anxious to see what was going to happen. They came with a, a zinc piece of roofing and, and two sticks. They laid the, the body on there. They took it over there by the casket until they finished hammering all the four pieces in uh, together, the bottom, and then they laid the body in there, and then they uncovered her face. And then they called the five ch children to come and kiss their mother goodbye. I watched the children kiss their mother goodbye. I was so grateful I had brought the body so that they could say goodbye to their mother. I was in a hurry. I had other work to do. I was anxious to go, but the Holy Spirit said, stay. Lord, I'm t I got more work to do. I stayed. I was asked to do the funeral. I was invited back to the village, and the village said, we have never seen this kind of love before. We would like to give you that little beautiful hillside for you to build a church on and for you to have a permanent presence because we want you in our village. Adventures. Painful. 
difficult. We went to Venezuela some years later, started up the aviation program. About five years ago, our pilot and his wife and the school director and the patients disappeared. We searched for them. We thought it might have been an accident. After searching throughout the entire jungles, I became convinced it was a hijacking. And then we saw our airplane, several w villages testified our airplane being flown by military pilots had landed in their village several times. And they said, that pilot, Bob Norton, we later heard from the military that they killed him. The two women were held for several years. We heard one of them is dead. We don't know where they are. The patients disappeared. Adventures. It takes your life. It takes everything you have. After the plane disappeared, they called from a village and said the next day, a little six-month-old baby rolled off the bed and fell into the fire. Over 50% of burns on the body. Could you please come pick up the baby and take, her to, take the baby to the hospital? Sorry, no airplane. Four days later, they called and said, a drunk man stabbed his wife with a broken bottle. She has all her intestines out in her arms. Could you please pick her up and take her to the hospital? Sorry, no airplane. She died in agony. The pilot in Guyana, born and raised in Africa from a missionary pilot family, Gary Roberts, said, I'm going back to Africa. It is the country that I was born and raised in. I speak Swahili. I speak Kanandi. I speak French. I speak English. I speak Indonesian. I am going back to conquer that continent. He left with his wife, two little children, went back to, f to work in Chad. His little boy got malaria. He was working at an Adventist hospital. They tried everything they could, but they buried Caleb and left him in Chad. Mission Aviation Adventures. A lady was in labor for four days. The baby would not be delivered because it was crossways in the womb. Finally, the arm came out and they realized the baby was dead. They called and said, please come pick up the lady. But it was evening. The next morning, she was dead. These are the adventures mission pilots live with. I don't know why I'm still alive. I've been hijacked assaulted, beaten, assaulted by gangs twice. I'm still alive. I don't know why. May not be very much longer, but I've already made up my mind that I have lived long enough. I have lived more than the average. Let me ask you, are you here alive today because God did something to save your life? Raise your hand if you are. That's over half of you. Everything you are and everything you have belongs to God. It's no longer yours. You are living on borrowed time. And we yet have a short time to work. But everything you have, your talents, your skills, your education, your influence, cars, houses, properties, everything belongs to the Lord. It is not yours. There are mission pilots they need airplanes. We are here to talk about Brianna. I had a chance to talk to her several times as she prepared her life. We don't know yet why God allowed her to close her life story early. And we don't know why we are still here. But we do know one thing. While we have life, we have a responsibility. And our responsibility is to be ambassadors for the life giver and to share life with those that have lost it. Brianna's dream was to be a mission pilot and we are here to help carry out three things. 
not only to support mission aviation by subtraining pilots and providing aircraft, but also here in the States to provide media skills. She chose media as part of her training and to support the Unseen Media Group with their work, young people that have already, some of, some of them have already served on the front lines and they are now here to do something that is very expensive and very difficult, almost impossible to do, but they're placing everything on the altar to get it done. And we adults are to back up our young people. The young people have energy and skills and training, but they don't have money. Guess what? Most funding is in the hands of older people. The young people don't have funds. They have what they have, education and energy. On a community level, we have the Elijah House, which does training. Training of people that live on the streets, of those that have never been able to conquer themselves. Those that need basic training in life to just be responsible and to survive and be useful again in society. If you think that's easy, you try it. It is a very difficult task, and it takes a lot of Christian love and godly love in your heart to be able to do that. So we have mission aviation, we have media, and we have community work. And this is why we're here today. Mission adventures is not about adventures. It's about sacrifice. I want to apologize to you tonight that we have, are in this comfortable place. I'm sorry. I wish it was logs you were sitting on. Because comfort is fatal. Most people will die because of comfort. We are too comfortable as a nation. We need to be in a position of sacrifice and difficulty before we realize what we have. We take it for granted. And so I apologize to you for this beautiful, comfortable location. Not that it's inappropriate, but it is fatal. And may God soon take that away from us, our comfort level, so that we might be able to be saved. And we might wake up from our lethargy, and we might wake up from our comfort to realize we have a short time to do a great task which involves great sacrifice. Someday, every human support will be taken away. We will have nothing left. Praise God for those that place everything on the altar before it's taken away. It's much better to place it on the altar and to have God use it than it is for somebody to come and take it away. The sooner we learn to depend totally on God, the safer we are and in the better position. So tonight, I want to ask you to deep, deep in your minds to think a little bit. I, I would like to ask Brother Neville to accompany us while we do this. In your memories, Banks, as you think back at what God has done for you, you are alive. Most of you today, raise your hand. You are alive today because God did a miracle to save your life. Raise your hand if that's the case. Yes, more than half. We have a responsibility to give back to God what he has given to us. To sacrifice that which is already his. It is not ours. We are managers. We are stewards. And God is saying, tonight, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to be part of the finishing work. The world, like the Titanic, is going down. Would you agree with me? that the world is rapidly accelerating toward final destruction, raise your hand if you would agree. You have an opportunity to be used. You're alive tonight. Brianna is resting, waiting her reward. We are alive and we have yet a responsibility to continue the work that others have been called to lay down. And therefore, as you think back at what God has given you, ask yourself, what have I done with that which God gave me? Have I managed it for His work? Or have I managed it 
for my benefit. Think back of the privilege you have and I have. It's not about adventures. It's about picking up our cross and following Jesus to the grave. We must die to self or we must die physically, but we have to die. We are called to the grave. And if God calls us to die while we're working, or he calls us to live until he comes, we are to place all on the altar and let God have total control of us. But we have a little opportunity left. The four angels are holding the winds of strife. Freely we have received, freely we must give. You can never outgive God. But tonight, as you have received some envelopes, as you have received the opportunity to give back to God what He has given to you. We're not asking, tonight is not about fundraising. It's about involving people and finishing the work. This is not about money at all. It's about you being part of God's work. Do you understand the difference? God, has, God owns all the gold and the silver. He doesn't care if his people give or don't give, except he wants to involve his people in his work. If nobody gives anything tonight, God is still going to fund everything. I want you to know that. Somebody else will take our crown because we don't want to get involved. But if you want to be involved and give back to God what he's given to you, you have an opportunity tonight. That's between you and God. This is about a spiritual event. This is about a call to mission service. Not everybody can leave to the front lines, but everybody must participate in the work on the front lines. If you are an ambassador for God. Imagine the words, I can't wait till Jesus comes back. Imagine the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. Over a little bit you were faithful, I have placed you now over a lot. And God is asking you to participate in his mission. You know what missionaries means? Participating in the mission. And what is the mission? Sharing what God has given you with others. While we're comfortable here tonight, there are men and women dying in agony. We, looked at, we saw the pictures during the beautiful concert we just saw of people who already passed away and the pain of the loved ones. But there are people that are dying right now that can't be saved if somebody cares enough to go. And you have the capacity to go. Maybe some of you want to go yourself. And maybe some of you want to help send somebody else. That's our choice tonight, to participate in the mission. You raise your hand tonight saying, God saved my life. Your life is no longer yours. It belongs to God. And I pray that tonight, somewhere deep in the recesses of your mind, you will make that commitment and say, Lord, whatever it takes, I am alive today. I'm here because you gave me the gift, and I do not want to waste that gift. I will do everything I have to do to be part of the mission of saving people's lives. And then we will hear the words, Jesus was on the cross, and as he looked out across history, he saw all those that would accept him someday and a joy that he would have before him. But every time a person is saved, there is great joy in heaven because one more person, and I have to confess tonight, almost with tears in my eyes, that one time God threw his arms around me, and he said, thank you. I was complaining to the Lord because I had just gone to Brazil and he'd asked me to do something so difficult, so painful. I said, no, Lord, no, please, not again. It, uh, but I did it. But I was complaining. I was on the airplane looking out the window. I was going, Lord, why, why, why? And suddenly, shoo, God's arms went around me. I said, Lord, is that you? He said, yes. I just came to say thank you for what you did. 
because you accepted to do what I ask you to do, my reward for my sacrifice will be so much greater. How can I complain anymore? How can God tell me thank you when I'm the one that must cast my throne at his feet? But he did. He said, thank you. Don't we want to hear those words tonight? After God gave us so much, can we say thank you? We have a young man here tonight whose supreme passion is traveling the world with his wife, <clears throat> Wadi, sharing God's end time message of hope with others. Their mission is to change the population of heaven one soul at a time. Amen. Amen. By sharing hope, health, and harmony of heaven with our world. So at this time, I'd like to have Pastor Taj and Evangelist uh, Packlet. Thank you. <laughs> Let's welcome him. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight in this special event, this special occasion. I'll never forget the day that I was on Facebook and I saw a post of someone that shared the tragic news of the terrible accident that Brianna was in. I had vaguely remembered her from the days when the Cassidy family lived in Clovis. She was very young in Sabbath school, and I was just beginning my ministry, sharing the gospel with others. I had not really known her too deeply or intimately, and so I went online and, and uh, looked up on Facebook. Later on, I spent some time on the website and got to know her better, and I, f I realized that I had a lot in common with Brianna. She was a photographer, and that's what I love to do. She was also a scuba diver, and that's one of my most favorite things in the world to do. She loved to travel. She, was, she had aspirations of traveling the world, and that's the same way I felt. And she had a passion for Jesus. I felt an immediate connection, and my heart was so sad and so heavy. I wept when I was just looking at the pictures, thinking about the family. But her life, just by looking at those pictures and the website, has changed me forever. It has uh, challenged me to live more fully to laugh more frequently, to love more deeply, and to work more earnestly to hasten the day when death itself will die, the day of our Lord Jesus' return. And so I'm privileged and honored to be able to share just a few brief words of hope with you tonight. I want to begin by sharing with you a story about a man by the name of Horatio Spafford. What was his name? Some of you have heard this story before, but Horatio, Horatio Spafford was a successful lawyer and businessman that lived in the city of Chicago. He had a beautiful wife and four precious daughters. The Spaffords were devoted Presbyterians. They were believers in Christ. And life was nice and easy until tragedy would change their lives forever. It was in 1873 that Horatio decided to take his family, his wife and four daughters, on a family vacation to Europe. Just before the trip, however, some urgent business, last-minute business, kept him from going. So he decided to send his wife and four daughters ahead of, the, uh, ahead of him. While he took care of this last-minute business, he would meet with them shortly thereafter. And so he was there with his family on the dock. He kissed his family as they boarded the ship, the ship called the Ville du Havre. The Ville du Havre would cross the mighty Atlantic Ocean, heading and destined for Europe. And as Horatio waved goodbye to his family, he had no idea that perhaps this would be the last time he would look upon their faces. Because a few days later, on November 22nd, 1873, Horatio heard the devastating news that the ship, the Ville du Havre, that the ship that held his beloved family collided with an English boat and it sank in 12 minutes. And the 273 people that were on board, only 74 of them survived. 80% perished in that shipwreck. 
And Horatio, when he heard the news, not knowing what happened to his family, he began to pray. He was hoping for the best, but fearing for the worst. And then someone informed Horatio a few days later that his wife had sent him a telegram. And so he received the telegram and, and he read it, and joy quickly turned to sorrow when he read the two simple words on that telegram from his wife who was in Europe, just two words, saved alone. Saved alone. His wife survived, but his four precious daughters were lost at sea. And like a massive wave breaking on the shore, Horatio was hit with a tsunami of sorrow, grief-stricken and overwhelmed with regret. The question kept running through his mind, why did I not go with them? Why did I send them ahead of me? Why did I not postpone our departure? Why, God, have you allowed this to happen? If I was with them, I would have saved them. Why, God, did you not save them? Were you not with them? And with these unanswered questions, Horatio prepared his journey to go to Europe to be with his wife that was waiting for him. And he boarded another ship on the same dock that he last saw his family. And as he was heading across the Atlantic Ocean on that ship, all of a sudden the boat slowed down and the captain pointed out the place where the Ville du Havre had sunk. And as Horatio Spafford gazed upon the waters with a blank stare, thinking about the fact that his four daughters were some there, somewhere there in the sea, this was a place of death to him. And the churning sea and the billows and the waves was a reflection of the churning emotions that he was experiencing. Emotions of sorrow and anger, regret, confusion, and unbearable pain. And from this sea of death, Horatio turned to a safe shelter of comfort. He went back to his cabin on board that boat. He was smitten with sorrow and pain. But then Horatio, as he sat there calling upon the Lord, longing for the comfort of God, the divine comforter came and drew near to him. And then in that moment, somehow, this grief-stricken father knew that God was with him and that God would enable him to get through this tragedy. He knew that God was with his precious daughters, and he knew in his heart that he would see them once again. And oh, the hope he experienced in that cabin. He then wrote in his journal of that experience, he wrote these words, It is well. It is well. It is well. May God's will be done. And it's those words of faith spoken in a time of tragedy that gave birth to a beautiful hymn, a hymn that has brought hope and healing to a world that is hurting and dying, that beautiful hymn that says, when peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the joy of this glorious thought. My sin, not just part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Then the third stanza, stanza points to the blessed hope that enabled Horatio to endure the pain of death. The third verse says, And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. In this storm of unbearable grief, and through the crashing billows of sorrow and indescribable pain, Horatio found a sweet, safe shelter in the comfort of God. And it was this heavenly hope that enabled him to look at death in the face and say, it is well. It is well with my soul. How can we have that same experience? You see, the reality is, friends, is that we live in a world that is not well. We live in a world that is broken beyond repair. A world filled with pain and death 
confusion and chaos and sin and suffering. And the sad reality is that this is the lot of most people in our world today. Starvation, hunger, homelessness, broken homes and broken families and broken lives. Many people turning to drugs to escape the realities of life. Making individuals slaves to sin, slaves to habits. Did you know, friends, that our world consumes 100 billion aspirin tablets every single year because this life and this world brings so much headache and heartache? We live in a world where reading the newspaper and watching the news is a disturbing experience. International conflict, natural disasters, economic instability, moral decay, and as we think about all the chaos of our world and the suffering and pain that it inflicts not only upon the guilty but also the innocent, the question comes to our mind, why, God, do you allow your children to suffer? Why, God, if you are so good and so powerful, why does evil exist in our world today? And as preachers are preaching about a God of mercy and goodness and power, individuals around the world are demanding answers. And the question, the answer they want is towards the question, why does God not prevent the pain? And maybe you have that question tonight. You've been through tragedy. Why, God, have you allowed that to happen to me? If you're strong enough to put an end to it, why don't you do it? Why did God not stop that drunk driver from hitting that groom when he was on the way driving to his wedding? And now his wife-to-be the happiest day of her life turns to the saddest. What about those girls that were held over a decade in captivity in Cleveland as sex slaves? Why did God not stop the little baby from falling into the swimming pool and drowning? What about the elementary students at Sandy Hook Elementary? Why did God not stop that? Why does he not prevent the pain? Where is God in the face of all of this suffering? Oh, friends, I want you to know that God never intended for it to be like this. This world is not well. We're living in a battle zone, a great controversy, a war between good and evil. But, friends, the good news is that even though this world may not be well without we can still say it is well within, it is well with my soul. But the question is how? How can we come to that point? Well, friends, Jesus one day told a story in the book of Matthew chapter 13 that points to the source of the sin and suffering of the world. Jesus told a parable about a sower that went to, to, to sow good seed in the field. What kind of seed? Now, that sower was an illustration of who God is. And the field represents the world. And this sower that went to sow, what kind of seed? Good seed represents God who only had good in mind for the world. He never sowed the seeds of evil. He only had good in mind. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 29, for I know the, the, the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. But then the story goes on to say that that weeds began to grow up with the wheat. And where did these weeds come from? The weeds of evil and sin and suffering. Well, Jesus said that in the night an enemy came and sowed the evil seeds, the seeds of the, of, of the tares. Jesus made it clear that it was an enemy that has done this, an intruder that came in the night. And so why is there suffering in the world? It's not God that has sowed it. It is an enemy that has done it. And so I want you to remember, friends, that when your home is being torn apart by divorce, it's not God. It's an enemy that has done it. If you've been abused or neglected by your parents, it's not God that caused it. It is an enemy that has done it. If you're struggling financially, about to lose your home because of a bad loan, if you're struggling with health problems, diagnosed with cancer or diabetes or some type of illness or sickness, if your children are acting crazy in the world, it's not God. It is an enemy that has done this. If you're overwhelmed by the cares of life, it is an enemy that has done this. If you've lost a loved one and your heart is broken, it's not God. It is an enemy that has done this. Satan is the enemy that we need to blame for the suffering and the sin that is in this world. 
And so we know that it's not God that causes it, but the reality is He allows it. And that's really the question we want to find the answer to tonight. Why does God allow evil to exist in this world? Oh, well, friends, we don't have the time tonight to look at all the intricacies of the biblical answer, but I want to give you the short version tonight. And the short version is this. God is love. God is what, everyone? The very nature of the existence of God is that he's a loving, kind, benevolent God. He's a God of love. Love is the very nature of God, and it's the very foundation of his kingdom and his government. But question, what is the nature of love? Listen, friends, love can only exist when there's freedom. When there's what, everyone? Let's say, for example, Someone puts a gun to your head and they say to you, give me your wallet. If you cared about your life, what are you, you going to do? You're going to give your wallet. You see, force can control a person's behavior. But let's say that same person puts a gun to your head and instead of saying, give me your wallet, they say, give me your love. Love me. Is it possible to love that person? If you already have God's love in your heart, you can, but you're not loving that person because they're forcing you. Why? Because love by its very nature can never be forced, coerced, or demanded. Love can only be given freely from choice. So what is the nature of God? The nature of God is that he is love. But what is the nature of love? The nature of love is that love mandates or requires freedom. If there is no freedom, there's no such thing. Love cannot exist. Love requires freedom. Love requires what, everyone? Freedom. But when you give someone freedom, freedom produces a risk. Isn't that right? A risk for that individual to abuse your love or abuse that freedom. And so in creating the human race, in creating the angels, in creating humanity, God made us completely free. And that was a risky thing. But God was willing to take the risk. Why? Because having a relationship with us based on love, was worth taking the risk. It's just like when a man wants to propose to a woman and wants to spend the rest of his life with that person. In proposing to that, his girlfriend or whatnot, that's risky. Have you ever seen those YouTube videos where the brother makes a, a public proposal and he gets on his knees, the cameras are rolling, the people gather around, they get all excited, and he says, will you marry me? And then that the, the, the girl, you, you see her demeanor, she's frozen, and she starts shaking her head, and she starts covering her face, and she runs away. Don't you feel bad for the brother? <laughs> he was taking a risk, a risk of being rejected, but he was willing to take that risk. Why? Because the reward of her saying yes was worth taking the risk of being rejected. And that's what God did when he created humanity, friends. He was taking a risk in making us as free moral agents. But friends, God in his heart realized that a relationship based on love was worth the risk. God did not create slaves, nor did he create robots. He created free moral agents with the ability to choose, to make rational decisions. And that's the nature of of the love of God, it requires freedom. And unfortunately, the record tells us that this freedom was abused. First by a glorious angel by the name of Lucifer who began to rebel against the love of God and resist the love of God. And as re he resisted the love of God, a vacuum was created in his heart that was then filled with self-love. This angel by the name of Lucifer coveted God's power but not God's character of love. And so the record tells us that he began a rebellion in heaven. He rebelled against the king of love, but he did not do it with violence. He did it with deception. He deceived the other angels in questioning the motives of God. And friends, God saw the rebellion. He saw in the heart of this angel that was rejected and resisting his love. And how he was spreading the seeds of lies in the hearts of, God, of, of God's other angels. He was sowing the seeds of evil in God's universe. And friends, when you look at this parable of the sower, the servants in the parable says to the master, should we get rid of the tares? The sower said, let both grow together unto the harvest. Why? Because if you uproot the tares, you might uproot the wheat as well. You see, the plants must 
come to full maturity in order to distinguish the difference between them. And only when the tares are fully mature would God be able to uproot them permanently and eternally. In the same way, because of Lucifer's deceptive lies, the angels did not see the nature of the rebellion. They did not see what, what Lucifer was really doing. None but God really understood the nature of the rebellion. And so God allowed sin to exist for a time so that it could be fully matured, so that people could see that this is not good. He allows evil to exist for a time in order to destroy it for eternity. And friends, that's the basic question or the answer towards the question as to why an all-powerful and all-good God exists while there's still suffering and sin in this world. But friends, this universal answer perhaps is a personal one, a personal question for you. It applies as well. You see, God will allow us to go through temporary pain in order to secure eternal peace. God will allow us to go through trials and tribulations in order to save us from greater and eternal dangers. You see, we cannot see the end from the beginning like God does. Our human sight is limited. God is the only one that sees the big picture, and thus we may not always know the answer to the question, why God in our specific situations? But this we do know, friends, is that our God can be trusted, that he's shown himself strong and loving and merciful and trustworthy. And because of that, we, we can look into the face of evil and sin and suffering in the world, we can look at it in the face, in the face of tragedy, and we, like Horatio Spafford, can say, it is well with my soul. It is not well with this world, but it's well with my soul. Why? Because our God is in the business of eradicating evil for eternity. And how did he do it? Here's how he did it. My last point. He came to restore life through death. There's someone that came, friends, to restore peace through pain, salvation through suffering, blessings through brokenness, and life through death. The Bible tells us in John chapter 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's the devil, friends. He wants to steal us so that he can kill us and destroy us. But Jesus says, but I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And so, the light of the universe stepped down into the darkness of our world plagued with pain and suffering. He was born in a barn in a manger with the animals, misunderstood by his peers, grew up in the ghetto of Nazareth. That was the bad town in those days. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? You see, Jesus understands what it's like to be brought up on the wrong side of the tracks. He knows what it's like to go through poverty and hardship and difficulty in life. And he went through all of this to be close to us, to save us. He came to restore life in a dying world by dying in this world. He was subjected himself to the taunts and temptations of the enemy. And yet he overcame without sin. And finally, after three and a half years of loving, patient ministry, he would go to the cross. You see, we ask the question, why do the innocent suffer? The answer to that question is found when we ask another question. Why did Jesus suffer? He's innocent. And the innocent one, the one that did not do anything wrong, suffered a cruel and torturous death. Why? To restore life to us. Have you ever felt lonely? Have you ever felt forsaken? Have you ever felt like, man, this is not fair. Why is this happening to me? Have you ever felt overwhelmed with life? Have you ever felt like giving up, tapping out, throwing in the towel, and uh, aborting your mission? Jesus had those feelings while on the cross. He was forsaken of his people, 
seemingly shut out from his father. It wasn't fair. He was innocent, and yet he was suffering even though he did not do anything wrong. He was tempted to give up. He was tempted to feel like this is too much for me to bear. Even on the cross, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Are you asking that question? You go through tragedy, God, why? Jesus also asked why. He felt utterly forsaken of his father. But even after going through all of that, he trusted to the end and he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. It was like Jesus was saying, it is well, it is well with my soul. He was content to doing God's will and trusting God's will. And even after going through all of that, he made a comeback. Early Sunday morning, the first day of the week, Jesus came forth out of the grave as a conqueror over death. And because he made a comeback, you can make a comeback as well. Through a devastating divorce, you can make a comeback. Through alcoholism and drugs, you can make a comeback. Through unemployment and financial hardships, cancer and diabetes and sickness, you can make a comeback. Through the loss of a loved one, you can make a comeback. Jesus made a comeback. And because of that, we have hope tonight. We have hope. And soon, my friends, this Christ that came to this world to die, to restore life to humanity, soon the record tells us that he's going to come again the second time. And when he comes... Evil will be eradicated from the universe once and for all. And affliction will not rise up the second time. And the Bible says in Revelation 21 verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And so my brothers and my sisters, my friends, I want to encourage you tonight. Hang on to Jesus. Hang on to the blessed hope. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. We're living in a hostile environment, a fragile world. And soon Jesus will take us to our heavenly home. And as we're waiting for that great day, until then, let us live our lives more fully. Let us laugh more frequently. Let us love more deeply. And let us work more earnestly to hasten that glorious day, the day when death itself will die. Amen. I want to invite my brother Neville to come up. He's going to sing this closing song. And as he does, I want to share with you this closing story. In the 1930s, there was a jazz musician by the name of Thomas Dorsey who lived in a little apartment in the city of Chicago, very poor in his early days, his wife was nine months pregnant with their first child, and Thomas Dorsey received a telegram inviting him to play in a band in St. Louis. Now, he hesitated whether or not he should receive the invitation because his wife was nine months pregnant, the baby was to come any day now, but they really needed the money. And so finally, he made the decision that he ever after would regret. He left his wife there in the apartment. He went to St. Louis. He played in the band that night, and when the show was over, as he descended from the stage, someone placed a telegram in his hand, and the telegram said, you are now the proud father of a little baby boy. But we're so sad to inform you that your wife has died in childbirth. And when he received the news, you can imagine how he felt. He got back on the train, heading back to Chicago. Tears were flowing from his from his eyes he felt so guilty for leaving his wife when he should have been there he was so angry at himself angry that that he made the decision to go and play music instead of being with his family he got to the hospital only to learn that the baby boy died shortly after that as well he lost his family like that for the next two weeks, Thomas Dorsey was in a dark place, deep depression, deep despair. He could not eat. He could not sleep. He could not be comforted. It seemed like heaven was so far away that heaven was indifferent to his pain. 
and he blamed the music for taking him away and he said I'm never gonna touch music again he blamed the music and it was so dark but after two weeks he sat at his piano missing his wife feeling so guilty asking God why when all of a sudden it was as if heaven came down and glory filled the room he sensed the comfort of the divine comforter and then he began to play a tune at the piano and then words of comfort words of hope words of peace began to flood his mind and he began to write those words down which became the song the beautiful song he wrote the words precious Lord take my hand lead me on let me stand I'm tired I'm weak I'm worn through the storm through the night lead me on to the light take my hand precious Lord and lead me home from that dark tragedy the light of heaven shone and from that was given to the world a precious song reminding us of the hope that we have that even though we are tired weak and worn down by this world the hand of Jesus is there to lead us through the storms the trials right into the promised land what are you going through tonight friend are you struggling is your heart broken has your spouse walked out on you are your children disrespecting you are you struggling financially or with health problems your marriage being attacked you've lost a loved one your heart is broken well today lay those burdens at Jesus feet take his hand receive his joy receive his peace it won't be long we're about to enter into the promised land the precious Lord is gonna lead us home amen I want to invite you to Bow your heads and close your eyes if you wish. Listen carefully to the words of this song, and then we'll close this evening. Listen carefully. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak. I'm worn through the storm, through the night. Lead me on to the light, precious Lord. Take my hand and lead me on. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, and I'm worn through the storm. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on. Bible cracked and faded by the years. Remember me in a sanctuary filled with silent prayer. And age to age and heart to Child of wonder, child 